All right, we're going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 16 tonight, <clears throat> and you can tell I'm still having fun with my sinuses and allergies and whatever all this is, so it's probably going to be a short one tonight. I don't know how long my voice will hold out, <clears throat> so we're not going to talk about the whole chapter of Genesis 16. We're really going to just focus in on verses 13 and 14 and an important lesson that we learned here uh, about God and <clears throat> about his care for his people. This chapter has to do with Hagar and Sarah's idea for Abraham to uh, be with Hagar and to have a child by her in order for him to have a descendant to uh, fulfill God's plan and God's promise. <clears throat> so if you remember in chapter 15, Abraham was concerned that he didn't have any children and that Eleazar, who was a steward of his house, would be the heir. And God told him it would be one of his own. It would spring from his loins. And still, a child hasn't been born. Uh, we learned that they've been in the land of Canaan for 10 years. Abraham was 75 when he left Haran and came into Canaan, so he's 85 now. And still, no child has been born. So they're wondering <clears throat> about God's promise. Um, why is it taking so long? maybe God wants us to fix this and so as we often do as human beings they're trying to come up with a plan and a scenario to help God uh, do what God says he'll do and so that was Sarah's plan Abraham agreed to it Hagar of course was with child and as a result of that uh, there was tension between Hagar and Sarah Sarah treated her harshly and Hagar fled she ran away uh, apparently, it seems she was going back to Egypt, where she was from, uh, headed in that direction anyway. And the Lord found her. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and spoke to her. And he said several different things to her. Uh, first of all, telling her to go back to Abraham and Sarah. And then he tells her that uh, her seed is going to be multiplied, that she's going to have a son, and he'll be named Ishmael. And verse 12 describes some of the characteristics of him. And we're going to talk about that all, Lord willing, in our next lesson. But in verses 13 and 14, after the angel of the Lord speaks to her, the Bible says she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer Le Haroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Barid. <clears throat> So we learn here that Hagar had actually been spoken to by the Lord. It wasn't just an angel, but this was a manifestation of God. And she declares a name here that, that is a name of God. <clears throat> One of the interesting things in the Bible, as uh, we think about and study about progressive revelation, is that God... He starts, like we've seen here in Genesis, Genesis 3.15, there's this prophecy but it's very vague, and as time goes on, it becomes more and more focused, more and more details become revealed. And nearly everything that God reveals to us in Scripture works in that way. And so in the Bible, we first learn about God with some singular names that are important and powerful. We learn about the name El, which has to do with, with God's power. We, of course, will learn about Jehovah and different names of God. But as time goes on, those names become joined to other words that begin to illuminate the character of God. And this is just one of those examples where God is given a name that not only describes his power, but it teaches us something about uh, his character and about how he works. So, here, God is called El Roy. Uh, the, the well where she um, met God is called a fountain. It's a spring of water. Was Be'er, which is well, and La, Hai Roy. And that R-O-I on the end is the word that's added to God's name. So when she called him, Thou God seest me, that's El Roy, the God who sees. And that's the name that Hagar gave to Jehovah, because of what happened in this, uh, in this situation. So <clears throat> let's think about a couple of the details uh, about the story here. Hagar um, had done 
what Abraham asked her to do, and apparently, you know, with, with good intentions, this kind of arrangement was not unknown in that part of the world at that time and even, you know, in many ways today as well. Um, Abraham and Sarah apparently had good intentions. They were trying to help God keep his will. But what they did wasn't, of course, according to the will of God. But because of this <clears throat> and this tension that arose between them, uh, she, she ran away. Uh, again, apparently uh, she was going back to Egypt. And God appears to her and, and says, you need to go back to Sarah. And this has to do with the fact that she's carrying Abraham's child. And God had a plan for Ishmael also. And, and he needs to be under the influence of his father Abraham. And again, we'll look at more of that uh, later. But God says to her that you are to name this son Ishmael. And the name Ishmael means God will hear <clears throat> so you have God saying that, that Ishmael's name means that God hears. So you have a God who hears the prayers of his people, and now Hagar under understands that he's a God who also sees, sees his people, sees the situations uh, that they're in. And she says specifically that he's the God who sees me. Individually, God looked down upon her and upon her situation. And before we go into the rest of this, I, I want to make sure we understand clearly here that so often as the story progresses, and even when we come over to the New Testament, there is a, an allegory between Hagar and, and Sarah. Um, Hagar is often seen as the bad guy. And we know the descendants of Ishmael, most of them became enemies of the children of Israel, and there's still that conflict that goes on in our world even today between Arabs and Jews. Um, but in the beginning here, Hagar was not uh, the bad guy. God loved Hagar. God blessed Hagar. God, of course, is going to bless Ishmael. Um, the decisions that were made later by their descendants are not, you know, here in the beginning. So this is not a story of God punishing Hagar or Ishmael or, you know, saying that they're going to be bad people, uh, even though he talks about, you know, some of the things that will happen. Uh, but this is God looking into the situation in the life of this woman and seeing her and in her need and providing for her and taking care of her. So in spite of everything that happens Later, Hagar is not the bad, you know, the villain of the story here. <clears throat> and I think we need, to, uh, we need to remember that. So let's talk about this name, El Roy, and what it teaches us about God. First of all, it shows us that God is aware of everything that happens with his creation. We sing that he's got the whole world in his hands, and that's exactly what this name refers to that God sees everything, not just, you know, the important people. He, he sees the little people, too, as we often think of ourselves in, in these distinctions. God knows everything that goes on throughout his universe and, of course, here on planet Earth. So these two words, El means, you know, refers to God's strength and his power, and God has demonstrated that here uh, in this story by his omniscience. He knew everything that was happening. He knew who Hagar was. He knew where she was. She's in the wilderness, you know, wandering about, not knowing what's going to happen to her. But God knew exactly where she was. He knew exactly what she needed. And he could see all the details of her life and the situation that she was in. And no matter where she tried, you know, to run... <coughs> and to hide from Abraham and from Sarah and whoever, she couldn't hide from God. He knew right where she was, and again, he was able to meet her in that place and to provide for her what she needed. So that's the L side, uh, God's power, his, his strength. And then there's Roy, and that word means sight or vision. Um, it has to do with seeing or looking. So he's the God of strength and power who sees. So God sees all, and he knows all. 
but it's more than just the fact that God is able to see everything that happens. He doesn't just see it and say, you know, that's happening, but he sees it and he's able to, to act and to intervene and to have a role in the things that are happening. So he can, he can help and he can provide and he can comfort. So when God sees us, it's not just to, to see us, to say that he's seen us, but it's be, to be able to, to give us what we need. And that's what we learn from, from Hagar here and from this name that is applied to, uh, to Jehovah. So it teaches us that God is in control of his world. Uh, Hagar and Abraham and Sarah all made mistakes here. They did things that were wrong, and God was aware of that, and he doesn't approve of their sins, but he was still in control. God had a plan for Abraham and Sarah to give birth to Isaac. That was God's plan, and they have interfered here with God's plan, trying to do it their own way, and now you have this consequence that um, Hagar is going to have a, a child by Abraham. Sarah and Hagar are, you know, separated from one another, and there's animosity between them, and, and and all these, you know, consequences from their action. But it didn't stop God's plan. He's still in control, and He can even take the mistakes and and even the sins of people because we have free choice and he can work through those to bring something good out of it and that's exactly what he's going to do uh, here so God saw their mistakes and certainly recognized them but he was still in control and nothing that man could do could thwart the plan and the purpose of God so again she might run away from Sarah but she couldn't run away from God and that's still true of us um, today. So even though Ishmael is not uh, the son of promise, he is the son of Abraham. And because of that, God is going to make sure that he is, is taken care of. And it's one of those fascinating details <clears throat> about history, you know, about the influence of Abraham, not just over the, the Jewish people, the, the descendants of Isaac, you know, the children of Israel, but also over the descendants of Ishmael and how even in the Muslim religion today, how they look back to and you know, look up to Abraham. And of course, Christians as well. His influence is tremendous in the world even, even to this day. And God recognized that and God's gonna take care of Ishmael just as he will of, of Isaac. So the point is that God was, uh, was in control it also teaches us something about the mercy of God and the grace of God, that they're trying to fix God's plan or help God out with his plan by, by putting their own in motion. And God was still merciful to them. He was still gracious to them. Um, he didn't allow Hagar to die in the wilderness or Ishmael you know, to die with her and not to be born. Instead, he, he not only provided for them and, and brings them back out, but he's going to bless Ishmael so he becomes the head of this great uh, line of descendants as well. And God didn't have to do that because they had sinned, you know, there could have been tremendous punishment uh, upon them for it. But he was merciful and he was gracious. And it's because he's the God who sees he sees man and he sees our weaknesses and our faults and our failures and he recognizes that we need mercy and that's why he sent his son when you think about all that jesus taught in the life that he lived and then of course all that he sacrificed in in his death we understand just how merciful god is the reason he did that he sent his son and allowed him to endure all those things is because he is the God who sees. He saw us and he saw what we needed and he provided for us no matter the cost. And so it's a lesson about God's grace and about his mercy. So there are <clears throat> some things that we need to, to learn from this and try to apply in our lives. And, and the, 
the primary lesson is that God is always present and he's always aware. And that's on the grand scale of things and the intimate scale uh, in our own lives personally and privately. God sees the big picture and he also sees, you know, the little struggles that we go through. And he doesn't just see it and is not just aware of it, (coughs) but he cares and he does what he can. He provides for us in those things, uh, you know, that we need. Uh, In the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 tells us that the word of God is quick and powerful, which means it's living and it's active, uh, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then we're told, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So God sees everything, all things. And, and his word, and the word of God here, has to do with the word of God, the Bible, but it also has to do with the word of God, the Logos, Jesus, the, the, the word, uh, is living and powerful, and it's able to not only see you know, what we do, but into the very thoughts of our, our minds and our hearts, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the, the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's how intimately God knows us, and there's nothing that we can hide from him. And so, again, he sees us and he knows us and knows what we need. And we need to remember that because so many times we, we either think that we're getting away with something from God that we can hide it from him or he doesn't know about uh, our sin or uh, even sinful thoughts that we have but he does he knows every bit of everything that we think he knows the true motive for everything that we do Uh, he knows us inside and out and there's nothing that he's not aware of the other thing we need to remember is that uh, some people are not comfortable with that but it ought to be the greatest comfort to us that because he already knows us, there's nothing we have to try to hide from him. Instead, he wants us to open ourselves up to him so we can you know, grow in, in the good things and fix the bad things. And that's why he's given us his word. He, he already knows us, and he already knows where we need work and, and the things that need fixing and where we make mistakes. He already knows it anyway, and we may be embarrassed about it or ashamed of it or whatever, but he already knows. So just admit it to him and, and confess it and do our part and, and admit that we're wrong and let him help us work on it. And that's what he does through, through his word. And so he's the God who sees. So he sees when we're lost in sin, and he provides us a way of forgiveness. And again, that's what he did through Jesus. God sees when we're persecuted. He knows when times are uh, difficult, when we're going through situations of of hardship and oppression. He sees those things, just like he did for for Hagar here in this difficult situation. He didn't forget her, but he provided for her. And he gave her the encouragement that she needed to do what, what she needed to do. And I think that's important to remember also that God didn't just say to her, uh, you know, everything's okay, and I see you're in a bad situation, so I'm just going to do everything for you. She had to go back to Sarah, which could not have been easy after the difficult things that they'd been through and the fact that she's still, you know, carrying Sarah's husband's child. There's no way that was easy, but she had to do her part in order for God's help to be provided and for his will to be done. When we're in difficult situations, persecution, whatever it is, uh, God promises to help us and to comfort us, but we have to do our part. And that's not just sitting back and wishing that things would get better. We have to do our role in actually doing what God says. And it's never easy, and it always brings difficult choices and and even more hardship and persecution sometimes 
But if we trust God, we know that he's going to see us through. But we have a role to play in that. And so Hagar had to do her part, trusting in God. And then, of course, he was faithful to his word. And then when we feel forsaken, God sees us. And he provides the comfort and, and the promise that we need. Um, try to put yourself in Hagar's position and how you know, she must have felt to be carrying a child and then to be kicked out of your home. And she's all alone. The only family that she had apparently was back in Egypt, uh, if they were even still there. The ones that had become her family now have you know, excluded her. And you know, here she is going to have a baby. Uh, clearly, she felt forsaken by, by everyone. But God is the God who sees. And he was aware of everything that she was going through and provided her what she needed to know and what she needed to do to fix the situation. <coughs> Excuse me. And, of course, ultimately it worked out that way. The point is that God saw. He saw her situation. He saw the remedy, and, and he showed her the way. And then she had to act upon it and do what he said. And that's true for us as well. God will comfort us even when we feel forsaken and alone. But again, we have to do our part of trusting him and being obedient to, uh, to his will. So I hope we'll think about that. Think about God as, as the God who sees. He's the God who sees us, who, who knows us inside and out. And he's also aware, aware of what we go through as individuals, as a family, in our homes, he knows what congregations face and struggle with. Um, he's aware of what's happening, what happens in our, in our country and in our world. And he sees it all. And he has a greater plan and a purpose. And ultimately, his will will be done. But his people have to listen to his word and trust him and do what he says. But we can trust him because he is the God who sees. And not just sees, but sees and cares and shows us the way to salvation, the way to comfort, the way to peace, and ultimately the way to heaven. So let's remember that about God, that he sees us, that he knows us, that he cares about us, and ultimately he wants us to, uh, to be with him for, forever uh, in heaven. So if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, know that God wants you to be one. He wants you to be with him forever uh, in that wonderful place of heaven, and that's why he gave his son. He saw our situation, what we needed, and he provided the remedy for our sin, the blood of his son. If you need to be cleansed by it, you do that by obeying the gospel. Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess him as Lord and Savior, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. If you've done that but gone astray and need to come back home to him, we have to admit that we're wrong, con confess our sins as we repent of them, and ask God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you and for you, and God, of course, will do just what he says. So we encourage you that if you need to do that to make things right with him, to make that decision, come and respond, even now as we stand and sing. Watch him, watch away.